Lindsay. Hi, Moby. Hi, Bagel. Hi, Moby. <laughs> and welcome to another episode of Moby Pod. And we have a very special guest, my friend Dan Butner, who invented, well, invented, who is the creator of the Blue Zones concept. Which I'm so excited to talk about. To me, I think the Blue Zones are a game changer in my life. And anyone that I've talked to about it is so fascinated because it's all about science and longevity and history and geography. And it's just so fascinating. So I'm really excited to talk to him. Also, on top of this incredible researcher and journalist. He's also just a badass. So you'll get to learn a little bit about that. Moby's intimidated. Um, I don't know about intimidated, <laughs> but there are people on the planet who I, you know, sort of revere. And of course, I like Dan a lot as a friend, but it does make me feel kind of inadequate. Like I, <laughs> I stay home and I watch old episodes of 30 Rock and I work on music and I play with Bagel and go for a hike. But like he rides bikes across the Sahara Desert. He rode a bike from Alaska to Patagonia. Like a and, badass. And I stayed home and played with synthesizers and went hiking. So in any case, <laughs> he's a remarkable friend and an inspiration. But in addition to having him on the show, Bagel has picked the winners for the May 4th live Moby Pod event. She went in, randomly picked four people with their guests. And so we we have our guests and we're really excited to meet these new friends. The one thing I will say, so we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people send in requests to come and it makes me sad and makes me feel guilty that we're only able to pick four people out of five, six, seven hundred people mm -hmm. who wanted to come. And I will say we're going to be recording it and filming it. So we'll, it'll be available to both listen to and watch for free uh, at some point, probably a week or two after the event. So for everyone who entered, thank you so much. I'm sorry that we could only pick four people in their plus ones, but the theater is as tiny as a theater has ever been. I mean, the theater is basically like a big comfy living room. That's very, very true. It did make us feel really good to see all of those submissions and to see all of your facts and all of the fun things that you had to say. And it just made us feel really loved our little Moby pod community showing up. And at some point we are going to have to go through all the interesting facts and maybe de devote an entire episode to just going through the facts because the facts were really good. Mm -hmm. So good. Once again, thank you everyone for entering and the four contest winners will all take pictures and stuff on May 4th. Yay. And now let's go talk to Dan Butner, who is both, I guess he's an, an intimidating inspiration to me. <laughs> Yay, Dan. Let's go. As mentioned, we're sitting here with the father, godfather of the Blue Zones. <laughs> Um, he didn't just invent the concept, he actually created all of the individual blue zones. None of these places existed <laughs> before Dan. And we're going to talk about blue zones, talk about health, but also I'm going to, why don't I start off with, with my question, my first question. Moby has a very important question for you. Which is, when I think of the things that you've done, like say riding a bike across the Sahara Desert, and being tall and handsome generally, does it bother you that you make the rest of us feel bad about ourselves? <laughs> Do you have any guilt around that that you want to get all, off your no. chest? You know, I'm, <laughs> I mean, you're you're sort of the the uh, the paradigm of cool and hip, and mm -hmm. I'm I'm a I'm the king of beans. You know, I'm 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 the guy who's trying to make beans cool. I like beans a lot, and, and you have great music and cool friends and my friends are like Pinto and Garbanzo. <laughs> but still, I, I find myself like I have a few friends <laughs> like you or like, let, let's say like Rich Roll. Oh, yeah. Um, or I have a friend in Connecticut who knows how to build furniture and I can't help but feel inadequate by comparison. Not in a, not even in a bad way because like I, I do look for any opportunity to feel bad about myself. <laughs> but there's certain people like you who just make it so easy because you're like you rode a bike across the Sahara but Also, Desert. you've ridden a bike across many long places, yeah. right? If if your Wikipedia is right. 
Yes. You've done some real cycling well, in your Well, first day. of all, I love hearing this from arguably the greatest musician the human <laughs> species has ever produced. But yes, I have. I hold the record for biking from Alaska to Argentina, around the world, and top to bottom of Africa. Well, hold on just a second. <laughs> um, you you breezed through that. You rode a bike from Alaska to Argentina? That's right. Yeah. it's It was all downhill. Okay. <laughs> so my aunt and uncle, because my uncle's from Argentina. When they got married in 1973, they did something that I was so impressed by. They drove from Nebraska to Argentina. And I was like, oh, that's I was like wow, how impressive. They drove in a car, a VW Bug, from Nebraska to Argentina. That's driving. You rode a bike. Like just riding a bike from Alaska to Nebraska <laughs> would be unbelievably impressive. Alaska to Argentina. Wow. But why, why? Why would you? Why would you want to do that? I had a mentor in George Plimpton, who was a a, a writer and a participatory journalist, and um, he also I, started the Paris Review. Paris Review, and that's ah, right, editor cool. of the Paris. So he's a man of letters, but yet he was a man of action, and uh, he just instilled in me this idea of going out. Um, instead of just writing about other people and other people's experiences to sort of be the story. So you're you're both a journalist, but you're also creating the story. So, and I've kind of done that my whole professional life. So, but, I mean, George Plimpton was a legendary, because I actually got to meet him briefly before he died, because a friend of mine was the publisher of the Paris Review. But George Plimpton, he was legendary for sort of faking stuff. Like, like meaning, uh -huh. like he was this erudite writer who started the Paris Review, but he became a football player. To write about being a football player, he became a football player. But in your case, like, because I want to, but he actually Dr. became a football player. You know, he played for the Detroit Lions. He 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 wow. went in their training camp, and he talked his way into actually throwing two passes as a football in the NFL in sort of a Walter Mitty esque kind of way of being able to being a geeky normal dude writer who could experience it, but exceedingly talented at conveying what they what the experience is like of doing that. So in a way, my m most of what I've done has been an extension of that of that idea of of um, doing things that most people wouldn't want to do, covering the stories along the way, but also somewhat to a certain extent being the story. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it's just, you know, you don't do that sort of stuff for money. You don't make money doing that sort of thing. But um, you, uh, you become rich in experiences. And I, I'm sure you experienced it too. I remember George, we, we did this celebrity croquet tournament, and there's all these millionaires at the time. And nobody was paying attention to the millionaires. You, everybody flocked around George because he was rich in experience, and he told a good story. Mm -hmm. And that had a really powerful impression on my brain. That, uh, that's I want to do some version of that. And, um, you know, in a way, the record-setting rides, and I did a series of uh, expeditions that solved ancient mysteries. And now Blue Zones is really just an evolution of participatory journalism, but with the useful outcome. I do love the constant, like you've done so many things. There's just this effortless burying of the lead. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, well, yeah, well, I did I did some things like solved ancient mysteries. And then like you solve what what ain't how do you how do you breeze past solving so it was, ancient mysteries? It was called Earth Treks, right? Yeah, that was a company, yes. Yeah. And you I I I researched you. You uh, you <laughs> You might have noticed Lindsay sleeping outside your house last night. Just uh, just <laughs> making sure I, I was she, she has she has an envelope I mean? with <laughs> clippings of your hair. She she comes in the <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you later. It's, okay. I'm impressed with myself. But I love the idea of Earth Trek. So they do people still do it or what was it? The idea was to, when the internet was new, was the idea of letting an online audience direct a team of experts to solve mysteries, and then harnessing the wisdom of the crowd. There's a really influential book by James Cyril Wiki, who um, kind of pointed out that the collective opinion of a lot of people harnessed in the right way will produce a way better answer than most individual he, experts He was will. the economy writer for The New Yorker, right? That's right. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. But he wrote Wisdom of the Crowd, and I was very influenced by that. Also, this idea, this was right when um, HTML was being developed, this idea where you can navigate through the internet in a nonlinear way. And I thought maybe you could apply that to a nonfiction environment, i.e. Uh, an area where you're trying to solve a real mystery, gather clues. But anyway, there was a really ripe mystery back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, the greatest civilization in the Western Hemisphere were the Maya. 
They developed a very complex system of writing. The concept is zero. They built 24-story temples with no beasts of burden. And they suddenly disappeared in three generations. By about the ninth century, the New York City of the ancient world was gone. And nobody really knew. And these um, epigraphers, these people who could decipher hieroglyphs, were starting to crack the code to reading these glyphs. And there was about, I don't know, 15 archaeologists who were trying to answer different facets of this mystery. And I thought, why not bring the wisdom of the crowd and to sort of do a meta exploration of all these archaeologists and these uh, hieroglyphic readers, rather than them working in their own little pod, bring them all together. And um, our solution was largely accepted as the answer of why the Maya civilization. What was the solution? Well, in about um, the uh, sixth century, the population had grown so huge that they exhausted the carrying capacity of the land. So they ate mostly beans, corn, and squash. But in order to grow their milpas, they had to clear the rainforest. And uh, once the milpa was planted, it only lasted two or three years. So all of a sudden, there are 10 million people in this area that traditionally holds a couple hundred thousand. So the the land is exhausted. And then um, wars start breaking out because there's not enough food. And then we know there was this climatic event that traveled from Panama all the way up to uh, Arizona, where it collapsed the Anasazi civilization. It moved 17 miles per generation, and it hit the Maya area at the exact same time as the collapse. So you had overpopulation, you had um, uh, environmental degradation, you had climate change, and then we know from looking at the skeletons of the elite and the regular people who built all the pyramids, a uh, 2% of the population were about a foot taller than the workers. So you had this, this inequality happening too. So in a way, this exploration held a mirror up to America mm-hmm. and many of the same, in the world actually, and the many of the same things that um, confront our, you know, in a certain extent, our existence, mm-hmm. um, collapse another great hubris-ridden society, the ancient Maya. Wow. And I believe... Um, who were the, like the people in the Tigris and the Euphrates were all Mesopotamians? Yeah, like one of the earliest, earliest civilizations. I think they had a similar sort of cultural societal collapse for all those reasons as well. Like a couple of bad harvests, some climate change, income inequality, or like wealth disparity. Yeah. And yeah, within it's amazing how quickly civilizations can go away. Yeah. Well, yes. Well, they lasted. I mean, I mean, they lasted centuries or millennia. But yeah, it can collapse very quickly. And it's usually they forget the disciplines that made them great. Like the ancient Maya used to store grain for f- five years worth of grain. So if they had a few bad years, they life was so good they quit those disciplines. And um, it's always a climatic event. It seems a cl- climatic event is always the the straw that breaks the camel's back, which I think is particularly relevant for today. You know, in our global. Yeah climate change or whatever you want to call it. So you sort you figured this out on a platform that you created, this kind of Mayan mystery solution. And then that turned into the Blue Zones eventually? Or how did that work after that? So my company, Earthtrex, I had a full-time staff of archaeologists and scientists and writers and photographers and fil- small film crews and video, I mean, uh, satellite technology. was in technology. the mid-90s? It started in the mid-90s and I sold it in 2001. And um, we went on to do about 16 of these quests, we called them. And every, twice a year, we tried to find a mystery that was unsolved we could solve. So we took on human origins in Africa and collapsing the Anasazi civilization. Uh, we followed Marco pa- Polo's path across China to see if he actually really went to China. And we made a strong argument, one that made the Washington Post, in fact, that he didn't even make it. He didn't make it past Turkey, actually. So every year... You know, our business was finding a great mystery. We had about a million followers or a million subscribers at the Mm -hmm. time, which was a lot. And um, we were under a certain amount of pressure to find mysteries. And actually, it's my brother, Nick, who in 1999 stumbled upon a World Health Organization study that showed that the longest disability-free life expectancy in the world, where people were living the longest without disease, were found mostly among women on this cluster of islands in Southeast Asia, this place called Okinawa. And I said, aha, that's a good mystery. So Hmm. we did one of these quests there. And, uh, you know, these were, I mean, we sort of had to put these together in six months and they're fairly 
quickly um, uh, assembled. Um, but my personal interest was spiked, but so did our web traffic and engagement. So when I quit doing the quest, sold that company, then I went on and, and um, developed this idea of Blue Zones further. I reasoned that if there was an area in Southeast Asia where people are living a long time, there must be pockets of longevity in Europe mm -hmm. or Africa, maybe, or North America or Latin America. And that's, that's where the idea germinated. So the idea, in a sense, was to reverse engineer longevity. So 20% of how long we live is our genes. The other 80% is something else. And I knew from doing the Okinawa, there's this, this, this little corner of science called uh, demography. And there's a small pool of experts who know how to look through population data and find areas around the world where people live statistically longest. So if you know only 20% of it is genes, if you could find the pockets where people are living the longest and look at the common denominators, you may have enough correlation to be able to harness some insights on what is driving longevity around the world. So that was the idea behind Blue Zones. And we found five areas, it took us two and a half years. I was funded by the National Institutes on Aging and I had an assignment from National Geographic to find, identify these blue zones, and then try to distill some insights from these places. That's the idea of blue zones. One thing I love about the book is that while it's a very scientific subject matter, the way that it's written is very experiential. Like you really feel like you're along for the ride with you and you've inserted so much of your personality into it. It makes it feel so fun to read. It doesn't feel necessarily like you're absorbing the science in such a fun way. It all comes through. The George all... Plimpton Hunter yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, I, that's the biggest compliment you could possibly give me. So at National Geographic, especially, you know, the, the best way to somebody's brain is through their heart. And the best way to somebody's heart is through a story. Mm. So once you kind of digest it, the science, so you know uh, by looking at epidemiology, usually epidemiology, what are the things that are happening in each of these blue zones that seem to explain longevity? Then if you go find characters, i.e. most of the time 100-year-old people whose life match up with what the whole culture is doing, you don't have to tell the boring science story. All you do is tell the story of the emblematic 100-year-old guy who still stands on his head mm -hmm. or the 108-year-old woman who, you know, still has a garden and um, and is the spiritual leader of her village. Mm -hmm. And then it's a lot easier to convey the, the, the knowledge, I think. Yeah, that really it comes through. It was so fun to meet all of the people. But then you sum it up in this way where it's like, oh, yeah, OK, I was absorbing that all this time. But now you have all of these other books around the Blue Zones. You have cookbooks. You have... Just a point on the cookbooks. They're not meant to be cookbooks. So the first book, uh, Blue Zones a Kitchen, which did very well, bestseller book I ever wrote, the idea... Actually, the core of that is we did what's called a meta-analysis. So if you want to know what a 100-year-old ate to live to be 100, you have to uh, know what they were eating their whole lives. So we found 155 dietary surveys done in all five blue zones over the last 80 years. So we knew what the population was eating when a, a centenarian, 100-year-old living today was 20. Mm. And when they were 40 and newly retired. And then when you crunch that all, and I have Harvard's Walter Willett help me with that, um, you start to see a very clear dietary pattern. And we we caught, captured that in the blue zone kitchen. But then once again, I knew in, in order to get people to read that, we went back to all the blue zones and, and got recipes from the old ladies. The old ladies, not always old actually, but the women are the keepers of the food tradition. In many respects, that food tradition is hundreds or even thousands of years old. So when you capture their recipes, which is really more a work in anthropology than it is, you know, going in Dan's kitchen or something. Mm -hmm. And this meta-analysis, the package is what I'm way more proud of the things that nobody talks about, which is the meta-analysis mm -hmm. than I am in the recipes, but people buy the book for the recipes. Well, something that they can I know I got bring in very clearly. Bit, but... Yeah. I mean, and also something I sent you this, but I got really excited to talk about one 
thing in particular, which is the magical, beautiful bean. And I made a song. <laughs> I made a song called Bean that. Corner. <laughs> well, and Moby also made a version of the song <laughs> Bean Corner. <laughs> yeah. If you might have, you might have noticed, we are ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> in the best way. <laughs> you feel down and you need a friend. You can always turn to beans. They're the only friend you'll ever need. Humble beans. So I know that you ride your bike all over the place, like from Alaska to Argentina, making people like me feel bad who stay home, and that you're originally from Minnesota. I'd love to know more about, like, what was your childhood like? I had a very adventuresome dad, worked for the Forest Service. He was a teacher. And when other kids went to Disney World for family vacations, we would go into the boundary waters of forests of... Like Thief River Falls area. Yeah, and we even north of there. Hmm. At the Canadian border, and we'd go for two weeks at a time with the Duluth pack and a canoe, and we go rely a lot on self-sufficiency. So I, I, I learned at a very early age to be comfortable in the wilderness and, and self-reliant. You know, we grew up lower, lower middle class, and uh, I put myself through school and went to study in Spain my junior year. And uh, ap upon graduation, when other people do useful and productive things with their life, I went and raced bikes in Spain for a year and then went and lived in Paris and wrote. And um, my, my boot camp for writing was living in Paris and covering the sort of um, literate beat. Uh, so you're Paris. basically like the plant-based Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I live very close to where Hemingway lived in Rue de Flores, de las Flores, in in, um, in Paris for a while. But yeah, he influenced me quite a bit. And then um, spent eight years doing the uh, ultra-long bicycle rides, wh which that experience, I think if everybody had experience like that, the world would be a better place because you learn a certain empathy I can't tell you the number of times in parts of rural Africa where you know, people, their their total net worth is $100, and yet they sit in there, share their meal with me, share mm -hmm. dinner with me, or they might not have anything but shelter and a pot and a fire, but they'll give it to you. And uh, it's very hard then to come back to America and be prejudiced or, mm -hmm. or be judgmental of other people. And um, so that th those are really, really valuable times for me, just being a human. So for people who are listening, like Lindsay and I and almost everyone I know is so intimately familiar with Blue Zones at this point. I mean, in my case, from conversations with you, from reading the books, from reading the National Geographic articles, from following you on social media. But insofar as you can, I don't want to put you on the spot, sum up what are the contributing variables, contributing elements that have helped people become these healthy, long-lived residents of blue zones. Uh, yes, I can make some common denominators in all, in all five blue zones. And by the blue zones, we found one in the highlands of Sardinia, longest lived men, the longest lived women in Okinawa, Japan, Ikaria, Greece, eight years longer than Americans with no discernible dementia, which is huge. Whoa. Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, half the rate of middle-aged mortality. So they're about- And uh, Melinda, right? And Loma Linda, California, among the Seventh-day Adventists. Okay, so those five areas, what do they all have in common? Well, number one, they're eating mostly a whole plant-based diet. They eat very, shockingly little meat, um, very little eggs, very little cheese, even very little fish. The, the pillars of every longevity diet in the world are whole grains, corns, wheat, and rice, greens, about 70 kinds of greens, a handful of nuts, tubers, like sweet potatoes. That was six, two thirds of the dietary intake of uh, Okinawan centenarians in the their purple, life. The purple, purple potatoes. Purple sweet potato, yeah. emo. And then beans. And beans are the cornerstone of every longevity diet in the world. If you're eating about a cup of beans a day, it's probably adding about four years to your life expectancy. Um, beyond food, though, we tend to focus a lot on food. And I know, you know, the runway for most people for a health change is through their mouth. So that's why, you know, I often lead with food. But perhaps even more importantly, we know that having a strong sense of purpose, knowing why you wake up in the morning or ikigai, 
is worth about eight years of life expectancy. Mm. Have, having a, a strong, loving social s- pod around you. You don't have to have, you know, 500,000 uh, Instagram out, cause, friends. Because everybody hates me. <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, come on. Bagel seems to like me. <laughs> um, but having a few, it's, but it is more important than you think. The technical definition of loneliness in America is not having at least three friends you can count on on a bad day. Mm. That's the litmus test. And if you don't have that, it shares about eight years off of your life expectancy compared with an equal person who has three to five good friends. So in blue zones, everybody, you know, they often are born into what's called a moai. They have sacred daily practices that reduce the stress of everyday living, ancestor veneration, taking a nap, uh, happy hour, uh, prayer seems to work. Um, they put their family first. Uh, they don't exercise, which is disruptive often, because we tend to think as exercise is the answer to keeping our bodies fit. Mm. But nobody exercises in blue zone. Nobody's doing CrossFit, or nobody has a ecliptical in their basement, or pumping iron, or doing triathlons. They but just they move walk. constantly. Yeah. Yeah. They're Every walking, time they go to work yeah. or a friend's house, they're walking. Mm-hmm. They have a garden out back, which I think is a great longevity strategy. Mm-hmm. They don't have mechanical conveniences to do all their work. Mm-hmm. So my team figures are working about, I mean, they're moving every 20 minutes or so. But here is the organizing principle. Here is the big idea. In all these blue zones, when you see spry 100-year-olds, it's never because they try to live a long time. You don't see pursuing this sort of maniacal pursuit of health. And by the way, social media is full of these influencers who are hacking your biology mm-hmm. and uh, diets and exercise programs and supplements and superfoods. You mean I, I, I shouldn't be drinking turpentine urine smoothies? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you enjoy them. <laughs> but the big insight is health and longevity are not pursued in blue zones. It ensues. And it ensues for having having the right environment. Mm. These people don't have better genes. They don't have great, better, greater discipline. They don't have a better sense of individual responsibility, which politicians are shaking their finger at us all the time to do in America. They simply live in areas where the healthy choice, uh, eating beans is cheaper, uh, more accessible, and more delicious than eating a burger, for example. Mm. So people eat beans. Um, it's easier to walk than it is to drive. The possibility of, of imploding into your home and sitting on your phone for 12 hours doesn't exist because it's first of all you're in the streets most of the time and if you don't show up to church or the festival or somebody hasn't seen you for a while somebody's pounding on your door to get you out there um, and purpose comes with mother's milk there you know in america we live in this almost sort of existential community of you know what are we what are we here especially males you know, young males. It's like, they're. I think they're lost as a generation. Mm-hmm. In Ikaria, for example, you are imbued as a young man that you are first an Ikarian. Your responsibility is to keep the culture alive and take care of the elders. You don't have to think about it. And um, in a way, that's a gift because mm-hmm. people have purpose. They know why they wake up. They're more likely to stay fit. They're more likely to take their medicines. They're more likely to stay mentally engaged. And this is a very different way at looking at longevity compared to the Silicon Valley biohacking with metformin and resveratrol and testosterone therapy. It's almost diametrically opposed. It's also interesting, just as an aside there, because you're right, like I went to this event a few years ago at Norman Lear's house. And granted, Norman Lear is 180 years old or whatever it is, but, (laughs) but it was about life extension. And this was so fascinating. There were some Nobel laureates there. Um, Sergey from Google was there. There are all these super fancy people there and everyone talking about life extension. And I hopefully channeled a little bit of the blue zones and I raised my hand and I said, what about a whole food plant based diet and being outside and having a sense of purpose and spending time with people you care about? And I was kind of looked at like you're a communist. <laughs> and, and, and what was so interesting later, one of the Nobel laureates who shall remain nameless, she was wonderful. We were talking and she said, yeah, she said, you're right. She said, that is absolutely the way to live longer and have a happier, healthier life. She said, but there's no way to make money from it. Can't sell it. That's right. And it was, yeah. and, and as opposed to metformin, resveratrol, all these things like 
The criteria by which most people assess life extension is how can you monetize it? And what you're describing, you, you can't sell it really. And what's especially fascinating, and I'm sorry if I'm really stating the obvious, is when they try and isolate the compounds, you know, when they try and remove antioxidants from plants to sell antioxidants, antioxidants removed from plants are harmful. You know, rates of cancer, if you're taking antioxidant supplements, can go up as opposed to embedded within the plant, it will be miraculous in terms of like life extension and health giving properties. So like the more they try and isolate these chemical properties, the worse it is. So you, you, you to the to the extent where you largely can't do it. I don't know if you found that to be the case as well in your research. Well, I, I, and sorry so, if that was a completely rambling. Leak no, that question. that was actually brilliant. The go, well, on, I mean, go on, no, go back to <laughs> being brilliant. I like that part. Well, you are brilliant, and I feel like I'm bathing in in the rich sunlight of Moby's intelligence right now, and and it's enriching me. <laughs> 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 I'm going to be yeah. hearing about this for months to come. Yeah. Like <laughs> suddenly, it's like thirty years from now. Like remember when Dan said yeah. I was. <laughs> Arabian brilliant son. <laughs> uh, so when you eat a strawberry, for example, it's got vitamin C, an antioxidant, but it's um, that antioxidant, that vitamin C is wrapped in a protein and you eat it, you chew it, it goes in your stomach. And if that was just an yeah, antioxidant, it'd be oxidized by the time it hit your stomach. But that sort of encasing allows it to enter your bloodstream and get subcellular in a way that taking a tablet or a chewable is just not going, not going to happen. But more, more important than that, there is this whole constellation of microchemicals. Apple, for example, probably has 1,500 different chemicals that we don't, we, they're so trace, but we don't know which ones of those fuel the microbiome or have some other biological f uh, impact. We know, if we're looking at populations that live statistically longest, they're eating the whole food. Mm -hmm. They're not taking any supplements or superfoods or trying to break, and these tend to be very cheap peasant foods. And for as boring it is, as it is, and for as crappy business model it creates, eating beans solves a lot of problems. Can I tell you a funny bean story? By all, all means. means. Okay. <laughs> it's not a song. Bean hour, right? Maybe it's not even funny. So as a vegan animal rights activist, I applaud the development of alternative proteins. You know, we call like clean meats, you know, even Impossible Burger, beyond. Like I, mm -hmm. I applaud anything that leads people away from eating meat and dairy. But I was doing an interview for a documentary about the, we'll call it like the, the new protein revolution. And I'm not going to criticize the new protein revolution, but at one point I said, what about black beans? I was like, <laughs> they regenerate the soil, they sequester carbon, they are a perfect food. Like, I mean, the fiber, the antioxidants, the protein, like you could not build a more perfect food and they cost nothing. And it's just so fascinating. Like it's the fact that we are spending billions and hundreds of billions of dollars developing these new types of protein when the perfect food already exists. They're trying to get food to match culture instead of shifting the culture which is exactly to match right. the food. That's which I'm not. And, and to be clear, like you're absolutely right. And I, I don't criticize that approach because it's the same way. Like if you were to go to, let's say, like you grew up in Texas. Mm -hmm. someone you knew in Texas in their 50s or 60s and said, hey, stop eating meat, eat beans, they would probably crucify you <laughs> or run you out of town. But if you yeah, say, there hey, there are the firing squads these days down there. If you're like, hey, instead of eating a cow burger, what about this other burger or this burger grown in a lab, they might be like, oh, maybe I'll try that. So it's that kind of tastes yeah. the same and you can still dip it in ranch and have fries with it. But it is so, I mean, granted, we're also the species that will dig three miles under the Gulf of Mexico to dredge up black crude oil rather than take advantage of the sun or the wind. Like, right. like we, we hate free things that are hard to monetize. Like, how can we take that free thing that's hard to monetize and ignore it while create an incredibly complicated Rube Goldberg approach to not fixing it? But also part of the thing, and I noticed I Sorry see for this, rambling on so no, much. No, I love that. I see a lot of people uh, posting or part of the conversation often when I talk about moving into a plant-based um, whole foods diet is people saying it's too expensive. Yeah. I can't afford it. You have to be rich to be a vegan. And what you're saying is 
you really don't. You, you can, can, I, can, I, can I can I can I can I talk about my soup now for a second? Because I have to like we, <laughs> I have to bring it back to my soup, and then I promise I will like stop talking for a minute. <laughs> so, in addition to inviting you over to talk to us for Moby Pod, I also made us soup. Yay! And <laughs> which is kind of our tradition, because the first time I met you, Dan, you made you made us soup. Yeah. So we're having it's it's and tradition. The reciprocal quid pro quo Full and circle. And my soup, <laughs> I started making it about 40, 30 some odd years ago. I used to, I was living in an abandoned factory and I was making $2,000 a year. And one of the ways I fed myself was making this soup. And it's leeks and scallions and onions and carrots and potatoes and quinoa and black beans and corn served with bread and hot sauce. But I started making it without knowing it was the healthiest thing on the planet because it comes out to about 30 cents a bowl or 40 cents a bowl. Like I could make, I could feed myself on $10 a week. So to your point about whole food, plant-based eating being expensive. It's like, no, when I was living in an abandoned factory, I lived on $10 a week mm -hmm. and I was about as well fed as anyone could be. Mm -hmm. Well, I hear the same thing. You know, my, my, my day job for most of the past 13 years have been working with cities, helping shipping, shifting them towards a whole food plant-based diet. And I heard over and over, I can't afford to, I can't afford. And people, I think, associate eating whole food plant-based with buying fresh produce, you know, at Whole Foods. I love Whole Foods, but... Um, that can be very expensive. But when you have a bean and a grain, it could be beans and corn tortilla or beans and pasta, pasta fagioli, or beans and rice. When you put those two together, you get a, a whole protein, all 19 amino acids and most of the fiber you need and all these trace um, uh, minerals, the copper and magnesium, iron. And I saw Three weeks ago at a Costco, a 25-pound bag of beans for $9.99. <laughs> that could make Moby soup for the next year. But I mean, you, feel everybody can, yeah. you know, at, at those prices, everybody can afford to be a prepper because, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and also, one last thing about beans that I'm sure you know that's so amazing. They were excavating a temple in Egypt. They found beans that were 3,000 years old. They still sprouted. Well, God, I love to find those beans. Isn't that amazing? Like, so, so not, so like they last in terms of being a prepper, like you could have beans for thousands of years and they're still probably going to be fine as long as they don't get water damaged. But just aside, there's a place uh, in uh, Dillon, Colorado called Anasazi Beans. And an archaeologist literally found a cache of 1200 year old beans, replanted them. And from that original plant, they, they now regularly produce beans. And for like 10 bucks a pound, you can buy 1200 year old Anasazi beans and wow. have them in your taco tonight. You know, the true genius, I often say, of Blue, of blue Zones, the true secret of longevity is they know how to make beans taste delicious. Mm. When you think of it in America, almost all the culinary genius goes into pork belly or fish or the cheesy dishes. Very few of it. I mean, there's a few restaurants we all love here in L.A., Little Pine and... and Little, Pine, Little Pine is, is closed. <laughs> We liked. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm. I'm. I'm actually. It, it had a I wonderful run. It's gone. Nick from Nick's. You know, Nick Adler. Do you ever been to Nick's on Beverly? If you haven't, it's so great. He's Nick's he's on he's reopening Little Pine, I believe, as a vegan Nick's on the east side. Oh, cool. So it's it's. it's so when I talk about Little Pine closing, I'm not mourning it. I was just saying, like, if someone went there, they would just find a. Oh empty, yeah, empty but there'll building. be a new one. It is Easter after all. We're time for resurrection. Yeah. <laughs> um, but. Um, Anyway, the point is, in Blue Zones, you have these generations of trial and error because all they could afford and all they had to eat were this cheap peasant food, beans and grains and tubers. It gets to be, you're living in the highlands of Sardinia and all of a sudden it's January and your garden hasn't grown for three months. What do you have sitting around? You have the beans. They've gotten really good at making beans taste delicious. Mm -hmm. That's where their genius is. So it's a lot easier to get. It's very hard to talk anybody into eating Boston baked beans or plain old black beans by themselves. But I remember in Icaria sitting around one afternoon with this lady who did this garbanzo bean pie. It sounds difficult, but she had 
very ch- rosemary, which she just picked. Rosemary grows all around here like a weed, mm-hmm. and made this sort of a savory broth. Cooked the beans in a savory broth, and then she took onions, chopped up the onions into slices, and kneaded the onions like you would knead bread. Hmm. Wow. Squish them, and then spread them out over the top, and then she put them in a really hot oven, which caramelized the onions, and then she stirred them into this rich rosemary broth, and the result was transcend it you know it just took a little bit of culinary effort to make this you know this great longevity food taste good and then you've cracked the code because at the end of the day i know you two guys you guys spend your life protecting animal rights and 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 you care about the environment deeply and you care about your health that's single digit percentages of America. Mm. Most Americans don't give a damn. They want to eat what's good for the, they, what they care about is their next meal and that tastes good. And we're genetically hardwired to be like that. We're not going to crack the code of these bigger issues until we figure out how to make whole food, plant based taste good. Mm-hmm. Or we, you know, we th- there's these, uh, you know, Beyond Burger and that sort of thing. I think they crack the code at making plant based beet taste pretty good, but it's hard argument to say it's good for you. Yeah. Uh, I'm not even sure it's that environmentally great um, at the end of the day with all the packaging. Beans, on the other hand, as you point out, you know, they fix nitrogen. It's just, they gr- grow sustainably. they um, full of fiber. They're low on the food chain. They're easy to grow. That's the answer. It seems like what you're doing with the Blue Zones is trying to make the ideology more accessible. And I feel like... In these cultures, these recipes are accessible because they've seen them their whole lives. They can go to their mother, their grandmother, their great grandmother and say, hey, how do I do that caramelized onion thing again? Yeah. And we don't have that. I always say and I love my mother. She's a wonderful, beautiful woman. But I didn't know that you could get a bean fresh from the grocery store until I was like 19. I thought it had to come in a can. I thought there was some sort of special thing they did in a factory to make them edible that you couldn't do in your own home. I just had no idea. So and I think it's a cultural thing. And I think that like there was a time in the States where that was the fad was get it from a can, do it as quickly as possible. We have microwaves now. And that cultural mentality really, really stuck because it was easy and fun to some degree. But now everyone is sick and we don't know how to cook basic food. So I think it's an accessibility issue, making the concept accessible, not just the food, because obviously it's as easy to go buy a bag of beans as it is to go buy a, a hamburger, right? you know, but it's making the concept accessible, which is, I feel like what a lot of what you're trying to do. Yeah, it's working on a number of different fronts. It's the, the books try to give, you know, most the Blue Zones kitchen books are all very bean forward. Probably mm-hmm. half of the recipes are, are bean recipes. But the best way to shape culture is to change environment. Mm-hmm. Um, if I think Winston Churchill said, if you want to shape culture, change, uh, change the environment first and culture will follow. Mm-hmm. So right now, you know, because of the farm bill, the grains that feed animals are so cheap soybeans and corn, they're artificially lowered. So that makes feedlot grain really cheap. And that mm-hmm. there, therefore, first of all, it produces fattier meats with higher higher omega-6 fatty acids, which are inflammatory compared mm-hmm. to omega-3 fatty acids. What is the farm bill for anyone that doesn't know? Farm bill, you know, it's, it, it dates back to Richard Nixon's secretary of agriculture, a guy named Earl Butts. And he was uh, largely the architect of a of a um, scheme which made uh, these the monoculture grains very cheap. Corn, soybeans, rice, sugar beets. And um, because, you know, quite legitimately, there weren't enough calories to go around. But what's happened is we've over-innovated now. So now we have this glut of cheap grains. What happens to that cheap grain? Well, part of it is is used by the food industry, the General Mills and the crafts. They unleash their food scientists on it, and they make irresistible foods like Doritos mm-hmm. with the Bliss Point and um, candy bars and high fructose corn syrup. And then it's also used as cheap grain to feed cows and pigs and chicken. Mm-hmm. Um, but we are subsidizing that with our tax dollars. right? And we're also kind of subsidizing it with the future by the way we're growing these foods is exhausting the soil. So now we have this really cheap 
junky food that competes with things like beans, which mm -hmm. don't receive the subsidies or kale or other fresh fruits and vegetables. So in a sense, we're making the unhealthy stuff cheaper and then the healthy stuff. And that also impacts how we eat. Yeah. Well, the subsidies, I mean, that's, I put out a book about 15 years ago called Gristle, and it was a look at the consequences of meat and dairy production. And no one read it because it was very academic. Uh, but when we were doing the book tour, that was the recurring question, cost. You know, we keep coming back to this, like the fact they were like, you know, isn't veganism is elitist and mm -hmm. and it's so expensive. I was like, well, it doesn't have to be. But also, I, I forget the statistic, but it's basically a family of four going to McDonald's. If none of the food at McDonald's was subsidized, it would cost about seventy five dollars. Wow. And so one of my life goals is to somehow figure out a way to remove subsidies from things that destroy people's lives. Like that's the, the sick aspect of our political system is we subsidize all these things that kill people. That are known to be carcinogenic. Yeah. And it's it, it's so asinine. I mean, I guess it benefits the pharmaceutical industry, it benefits mortuaries, it benefits <laughs> yeah. hospitals. Like it, it keeps people sick. It keeps people miserable. But like the fact that we're subsidizing food that kills people. It's so hard to wrap your head around that. Well, the farm bill is up for consideration right now. If you, now is the time to intervene. You... Fortunately, I mean, like, because Vilsack is the Secretary of Agriculture, right? Like, I'm for, I mean, I love Joe Biden. Sorry if that makes anyone mad, but like, food policy is not his progressive strong suit. Yeah, and Tom Vilsack's from Iowa, and when he was a senator, he also made sure that like the farm bill was very unprogressive, that they kept the subsidy system exactly as it was. So in, in terms of adventures, uh, do you have anything coming up that's going to make me feel intimidated and bad about myself? <laughs> if I did, I wouldn't tell you. Okay. No. <laughs> You're like, I'm I riding my bike to the International Space Station. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. I just, I biked for 10 days in Vietnam three weeks ago, got kind of a fix, my adventure fix there. And um, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm working on a, another uh, book right now. I'm looking into healthy life expectancy, sort of new blue zones, if you will. And um, it turns out that living a long time is not necessarily the same as maximizing your the number of years without disease. And there's a new um, sort of posse of scientists uh, international, and I've tapped into them about identifying pockets around the world where people make it to the oldest age without a chronic disease or any any significant disability. Um, so I'm interested in what drives that, and I'm beginning to work up on a book about that, which will take me around the world again. And is there a Blue Zones TV series? There is a Blue Zone TV series. It's coming out in September, but I can't tell you any more about it right now. Okay. That's very exciting. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty Because I do remember, for what it's worth, about like five or six years ago, I had a friend who worked at one of the big streaming services, and she mentioned that like her dream was to help produce a Blue Zones TV series. So I'm glad that it's it's happening. I am too. I remember you and I talked about it, I guess it was just before the pandemic, mm -hmm. about trying to but then, you know, it's one of these things, whenever I try to make something happen, it rarely turns out, but it's somebody just came to me and said, hey, we have an idea, what do you think? And over time, it just developed and we ended up working on it for a whole year. The big film crew, we have 28 people and, you know, really high-end production values. And uh, I, I, have, I have moderate hopes for it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let me ask you this. So you're working on this new book. Do you see any ideas about the blue zones potentially shifting? And will these blue zones remain blue zones forever, do you think? I think all the blue zones are disappearing. I'm, I'm sure they are, in fact. As the American food culture takes over, uh, diabetes rates go up and cancer rates go up and heart disease go up and life expectancy plummets. So the in a way, these, these areas with the highest healthy life expectancy are new blue zones. I suspect... 
though it's more going to be a policy story, quite not quite as interesting to individuals because it's less actionable than the blue zones. And I think you're going to see areas around the world with better education, uh, lower rates of infant mortality, more equity. And probably, I think the most important thing, this is a hunch from my happiness work. I did what a book on happiness. It's education of women. When you educate women, you get a much better return than educating men because women are, are the mothers. Educated women tend to have fewer children. Those children tend to be better educated. They're healthier. They grow up to be more productive. They grow up to make better voting decisions. And you get this sort of upward ratcheting mm -hmm. of, a, of, a, of a society. And, you know, I, I don't know 100%, but I sense that. I, I usually start out thinking one thing and find another thing. You know, I started Blue Zones hoping to find a compound that explained longevity around the world. There's no pill. There's no sub. There's no compound. And when I found that, you know, it's beans and purpose. <laughs> it sounds unbelievably boring, but there is better uh, research behind that than there is behind any statins, for example. And by the way, I, the story you told at the beginning, uh, Moby, about you telling the Norman Lear crowd that why not eat a whole food plant-based diet? A meta-analysis last year, huge. They followed about a half a million people for 20 years and found that people who just got about 80% to a whole food plant-based diet were living 10 to 13 years longer than the standard American eating crowd. There is no pill, there's no supplement, there's no resveratrol, there's nothing even on the scientific horizon that offers anywhere near a decade extra life expectancy than eating the way you guys eat and about the way we're about to eat here. In a, in yeah. <laughs> well, the way Moby eats, at least. Yeah, I Lind do Lindy does sort of sometimes <laughs> veer into the world of deep fried vegan. I love it. Well, I a, love a junk food. Well, first of all, you're younger and the body's more tolerant when you're younger. But but secondly, too, the I think a little bit is not going to hurt you. Every once in a while, um, treating yourself and cheating. We eat over a thousand meals a day, a year rather, and I a thousand meals that would be yeah, over <laughs> I mean, a thousand. Meals. <laughs> Makes me if, think if, of if, Monty Python and the meaning of life. Yeah. Remember <laughs> Mr. Creosote? Get me a bucket for my throw up. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen that? No. Oh, he explodes. Oh, ew. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. John yeah. Cleese feeds him an exploding mint that's wafer thin, and he explodes. Yeah, no, <laughs> It's worth watching. Yeah. It sounds great. But <laughs> in Blue Zones, out of the 1,100 or so meals they eat in a year, 100 of them are unhealthy. Mm -hmm. uh, they're pigging out. But the 1,000 of them are beans and grains mm -hmm. and tubers. And, and I think if, if we can get America to that, you're never going to get America to pay attention if you tell them you, they have to eat what they don't want to eat every meal. Yeah. But you say there's permissive. Yes, you can treat yourself once in a while. You can eat the fried you know, <laughs> buffalo cauliflower or whatever it is you like to eat. And that is that is Lindsay's that is what I really guilty love. choice. Yeah, like like you basically I you just channeled that. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you could put it. you could put vegan ranch dressing on <laughs> rotten garbage in the bottom of a dumpster, <laughs> and Lindsay would be like, "Oh, that's some pretty good looking rotten garbage." I'm a bit of a garbage. raccoon when it comes to yeah. that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, okay, before we go really quickly with all your travels. Can you name just a couple of the most beautiful places, the most beautiful things you've seen while you've been traveling? The middle of the Sahara, there's a place called Tamaranset, in the, uh, in, nestled in the Hogar Mountains, tallest mountain range in Africa, but completely devoid of vegetation, but it looks like a forest of of Devil's Towers. And the people there are the Tuaregs who come into town and sitting on top of these regal camels, and they're wrapped in indigo and they which leaches into their face and they have these blue blue face they're called the blue men that's a beautiful place um between the southernmost tip of africa it's not actually cape town it's a place called cape bagalas but from cape bagalas to cape town uh you go along the garden route of of south africa and on one side you have this cobalt sea and the other side you have kind of flower studded um african uh terrain Lake Atitlan in Guatemala, surrounded by 12 villages named after the 12 apostles, but they're Mayan villages with three volcanoes. And as you circle this lake, Huxley described it as beyond the permissibly per picturesque. It changes different colors of blue. Uh, and then north of there in the Patin jungle, the largest rainforest in North America, you have these 
Mayan cities that nobody's ever heard of, like El Mirador and Akmul, with 25-story temples and howler monkeys hanging out. Those are a couple off the top of my head. Wow. wow. At some point, I love that you're creating these books and this media that is of service to people, but just a book about beauty Mm-hmm. would be pretty special like cuz what you're describing like 99.9999999% of the people on the planet will never experience places like this and it's disappearing well a little bit self-serving i have um uh, in ma- making this documentary i took 100 pages of notes and i produced another blue zones book which is an update of probably 40% more insights it comes out in september and I've always had National Geographic photographers, mm-hmm. and we've probably shot 50,000 frames of centenarians in these blue zones. You know, when you do a National Geographic article, it's 15,000 frames, and maybe 10 show up in the... So this book has 300. It's a big, beautiful, more kind of photographic book, The Beauty of the Blue Zones, which comes out in September. Oh, okay. Great. So, I would, so, so you channel Lindsay with deep fried cauliflower, and I tried you... Ch- channeled you with the beauty of the blue There songs. you go. Okay. That actually really checks out. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there anything else that you want to leave any listeners with of places where they can follow you and what they should be checking out that you're doing in addition to the book that's coming out in September? I'm Well, if anybody has questions, I'm at Dan Butner on Instagram and I answer all questions myself. And I try to feed that regularly with, with uh, Blue Zones Insights. And um, I just wrote a book I'm very proud of called The Blue Zone American Kitchen, where I spent 150 hours at NYU with another researcher to articulate an alternate standard American diet as eaten by uh, largely immigrants 120 years ago, African, Asian, Latin American, and uh, Native American immigrants 100 years ago were eating essentially a Blue Zones diet. And this captures that diet and then 100 more recipes to live to 100, uniquely American. And um, I think these cultures have been largely overlooked. There was a a, um, scientist named Atwater who did dietary surveys 120 years ago. So we actually captured what these people were eating with some precision and brought back their diet. And here's these under-celebrated people who eating in a way that could save about a half a million American lives a year if we would eat that way. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. So I don't know about you guys, but I could talk for the next five hours. Same. But at the same time, you have to go somewhere fancy. And I made soup, which is not fancy. So let's go quickly eat my unfancy soup. And then you can go off to wherever, like if you're going to go like, have, I don't know, like play croquet with Bill Clinton <laughs> and the <Dalai> Lama <laughs> or whatever fancy stuff you do. This has um, been a real joy, you guys. Yeah, it's been wonderful having you, Dan. I'm giving you guys an audio hug. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Dan has left the building, and now it's just, sadly now it's just you and me and Bagel to bask in his warm glow. I hope he liked the soup and he wasn't just being polite. I gotta say, and I consider myself to be a bit of a soup connoisseur. It was really good soup. Thanks. You really crushed that soup. It was a beanie soup, which made me feel really happy after that conversation. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, I, I given my issues of self-doubt and sort of low self-esteem, I assume that if I make food and share it with people, that it's terrible and they're just being polite. Because one time I was in a relationship, this was years and years and years ago, <laughs> and I used to make pancakes for my then girlfriend and I. Mm-hmm. Which I thought was nice, you know, like I'd make like be like whole wheat pastry flour with oat bran and either blueberries or chocolate chips. And like I would make my own vegan milk with either cashews or oats uh, with organic maple syrup, like delightful. I thought delightful pancakes in our breakup conversation, the coup de gras, the fatal stab, like the the, the parting shot, <laughs> she said, and I never liked your pancakes. <gasps> After a couple of years of me making pancakes, naively, innocently thinking that she liked my pancakes, turns out it was a ruse. I was being lied to the entire time. So now that wow. left me with a little, my, my assumption is that you're just being polite, but still, thank you for saying that you and Dan liked 
my soup. Well, I can't speak for Dan, but he did say he was delighted by your soup, a palooza. I think he said soup a palooza. <laughs> um, so yeah, you did a really good soup job. And can I also say whatever hot sauce you put in there it was delicious. And because Moby is really thoughtful, he also made a little bread pieces with some oil and stuff in there. And that was really good. What you what was in that? The so that's oil. an Ezekiel sprouted bread. Mm-hmm with organic olive oil that had been infused with red pepper chili flakes, Mm -hmm. uh, organic basil, a tiny little bit of black pepper, garlic powder, and sea salt. And you just toss it all in that, you stirred it up in that little... You put it in the oil. Oh, it's infused inside the oil. I mean, I do it myself. Wow. So I add it to the oil and I let it sit for a while. Mm -hmm. So the oil takes on the flavors of everything. That's by definition the infusing. Yeah, yeah. And it's delicious. If left to my own devices, I would eat that for every meal of every day. But then I would um, probably have a heart attack and die of obesity within the next week. Well, I don't know if it would happen that fast, but I'm glad you're watching. I mean, it is as far as fat goes. It's it's organic olive oil. So it's very, you know, it's got filled with polyphenols and antioxidants. And also the bread is like sprouted organic grains with additional seeds. So it's definitely... As, as far as an indulgent, fatty thing is, it's definitely a healthy, indulgent, fatty thing. Well, I really liked it. Thanks. <laughs> uh, oh, also, just a reiteration, thank you to everyone who entered the contest for the live Moby Pod on May 4th. And we will be seeing four of you out of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who entered. We'll be seeing four of you on May 4th and we'll be filming and recording Moby Pod and also taking lots of photos and possibly even interviewing the four people who won. Mm -hmm. And once again, it was Bagel randomly picked. Didn't you, Bagel? Mm Mm-hmm. Yep, that was Bagel. (laughs) Uh, But actually, she did. Yeah, so she randomly picked, and we're excited to see the four winners and their guests on May 4th. Uh, Trying to think what else we should talk about, or do we just sort of respectfully, politely say goodbye for now? Let me say this. Just another thank you to Dan Butner for being great. And if you haven't read The Blue Zones, I highly recommend reading The Blue Zones. It was a game changer for me, and hopefully it will be for you too. And if you're not inclined to read, at some point it will be on TV, so you can watch the, The Blue Zones. I did listen to it because... I love a book on tape, and it was really fun to listen to. So that's also an option for you non-readers out there. So thank you, Dan. Thank you to all the people who've entered the live Moby Pod May 4th contest. And I guess that's everything for now. Yeah. Um, thank you for, for listening. If you're still here, you're <laughs> one of the real ones. And I can't thank you enough for being part of our little pod fam. And you want to say thanks to... Oh, yeah. Um, thanks to uh, Jonathan Nesvadba, who edits this podcast and does all the mastering and amazing things for it and music. Um, thank you to Human Content, who helps get this podcast out into your ears and into the world. And we will see some of you on May 4th, and everyone else will talk to you in two weeks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.